Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In last week's chapter, chapter three, we came to the conclusion that war as a general social activity, a general social process, can hardly uh, be considered as the continuation of domestic uh, politics. Admittedly, there are some wars, empirical examples of wars of the past, likely to be ascribed to the somehow private, singular, sinister interests of societal groups. This is what the liberal version of imperialist theories of war claims. And admittedly, too, there are some examples of wars launched by governments, political mm, authorities eager to profit uh, for themselves, uh, thanks to this war by recovering a lost legitimacy due to domestic unrest. Despite these uh, examples, domestic politics cannot be considered as a general explanation of the regular outbreak of wars. One of the main reasons this is the case is that most wars are not the consequences on the political decisions of one single actor unit, in this case states. Most wars are the result of the interaction of two or more than two states' decisions and actions. The fate of each state confronted by a risk of a war depends not merely on its own decisions and actions, but on the decisions and actions of the other states in the interaction and its own responses, reactions to this other state's actions and decisions. This is exactly the meaning of Clausewitz's uh, definition of war. War is nothing, I, it is a definition I already gave, war is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. In a duel, by definition, there is an interaction between two or more than two political units. This is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, after focusing on the unit level of analysis, be it the individual level or the, the individual actor level or the collective actor level, we have to focus on, we have to move to the systemic level of analysis. After looking at Kent Walt's first image, that is to say those explanations locating the major causes of war either in human nature, in the decision-making process, in the perceptions and misperceptions of different statesmen. After looking at the collective actor level of analysis, that is to say Kent Walt's second image, what happens within a state, pressure of different societal groups, etc. We have to move to the third image, Kent Walt's third image, that is to say the systemic structure and more specifically the anarchical structure of the international environment. Indeed, according to realists, and realists claim, rightly or wrongly, that they are able to explain better than all the other alternative approaches why wars regularly break out. According to realists, it is at the systemic level of international politics due to its specifically anarchical structure that the major causes of war have to be looked for. I quote Kenneth Waltz in his first book, Man, the State and War, influenced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. War, I quote, wars occur because there is nothing to prevent them. Wars break out because there is no authority preventing states from resorting to violence. And the same idea is put forward by Robert Jervis in his article uh, in the bibliography. You can find it. Um, Robert Jervis, Cooperation Under the Security Dilemma, we'll come back to him. The lack, I quote, the lack of an international sovereign permits wars to occur. Jervis, we saw Jervis in our chapter two with his perception and misperception thesis after publishing this major book. He abandoned somehow this uh, specific, topic, specific topic to focus on more general analyses of international relations and he started with the analysis of cooperation and security. We'll come back to, to his 
concept of security dilemma. Of course, I repeat, the lack of an international sovereign permits wars to occur. In chapter five, next week, in other words, we will look at the power distribution at the systemic level as a major cause of war. In this, today's chapter number four, we will look at the search for security by states as a major cause for war. Indeed, in an anarchical environment, states look for security and sometimes this search for security may favor, sometimes may favor the outbreak of wars. General argument, ladies and gentlemen, is the following one. There is no authority above state. There is no overarching central authority telling the states what to do or what not to do. Consequently, no state can trust no other state. No state can know exactly what another state might be tempted to do. No state can anticipate any other state's behavior. In other words, all states are permanently afraid of, I quote, being attacked, subjected, dominated, or annihilated by other states. I quote the American author John Hurt in his article, I put in the bibliography, which goes back to 1950, Idealist Internationalism and the Security Dilemma. He, John Hurt was the first to use this expression, security dilemma. All states are permanently afraid of being attacked, subjected, dominated, or even annihilated by other states. So there is a constant fear. And the consequence, the logical consequence of this fear is that each state must take care for itself. If you cannot trust anybody else, you must take care of yourself. And this is exactly the meaning of self due to Kenneth Waltz's neo-defensive neorealist theory. This is what he wrote in Theory of International Politics, 1979. In anarchy, security is the highest end. In anarchy, security is the highest end. Only if survival is guaranteed can states safely seek other goals, such as tranquility, profit, and power. The goal, the system, that is to say, the international anarchical system, the goal the system encourages states to look for is security. So very concretely, what does that mean? What do states do? Well, they increase their military capabilities. They increase what we may call their material power resources. In order to escape any other states' prospective power resources. However, and somehow unfortunately, these military preparations, these military, military preparations are likely to increase the insecurity perceived by other states. Those who see the first state increase its military capabilities. The other states cannot be sure that the first state's military uh, preparations are defensive rather than offensive. So what do these other states do? They feel compelled to increase their own military preparedness. They anticipate the worst case scenario to some extent. And due to this action and reaction, a mutual uh, a power competition ensues. A power competition, I quote John Hertz, a kind of vicious circle of security and power accumulation. States feel insecure, they increase their power resources, other ones feel insecure, they do so too, etc. etc. And this is what Robert Jervis in his article Cooperation and the Security Dilemma calls the security dilemma. Many of the means by which a state tries to increase its security 
many of the means by which the state tries to increase its security, decrease the security of other states. In international politics, one state's gain is often insecurity. One state's gain in security often inadvertently, unconsciously, threatens other states. Security dilemma rather than security problem. This is important. It is more than a mere security problem. Why? Because whatever a state do, whatever state uh, might do, whatever state does, it will feel insecure. Imagine state A confronted by state B increasing its military resources. State A, first strategy, first reaction, can decide not to increase its own military resources. In this case, by definition, it will be weaker at the point in time T plus one than at the point in time T. Therefore, by definition, it will feel insecure if it does not increase its own military capacities after the after state B increased its military capacities. But imagine now state A increases its own military capabilities. In this case, it will compel state B to go on increasing its own more and more. And in this case, there will be a, an arms race, and this arms race will have as a result that none of the two states will ever feel safe feel secure. And this, according to realists, is all the more so the case since states, by definition, always imagine the worst case scenario. They cannot but do so. Because if they underestimate another state's resources, this error may have dramatic consequences for their survival. And therefore, when one state increases its resources, all the other ones who have interaction with the first state, of course, all the other ones do so too. And this is exactly what John Mersheimer calls the tragedy of international politics, in this case of great power politics. It is a tragedy. Whatever states do, they will never feel safe because of the absence of any central government. You can sum up this idea in the, in, in the following arguments, whether states want it or not, so it does not depend on their goodwill, it does not even depend on their rationality, whether states want it or not, the rational actions undertaken by a state because of the subjective uncertainty, the subjective individual uncertainty regarding the intentions of other states, these rational actions end up producing and reproducing an irrational state of objective collective insecurity of all the states taken together. Each state feels subjectively insecure, rationally increases its own resources. By doing so, there will be a collective objective and no more merely subjective collective, objective, insecurity, and not merely uncertainty of all the states taken together. So this, of course, is a, a very pessimistic, a very gloomy picture of international politics, and this is the reason why Jervis comes to the conclusion, if this is true, we should all be dead. Why then are we not all dead yet? And the answer, uh, to this question is implicitly uh, present in Jervis's quotes, the one that I gave you two minutes ago. This is what he wrote. Many of the means by which states try to increase their security, many of the means, not all the means. So there must be a nuance that we have to look for. And he goes on, in international politics, one state's gain in security often 
threatens others. Often and not always. Often rather than always. Many means, but not necessarily all the means. This important point regards the intensity of the security dilemma, the kind of the degree of emergency of the insecurity that all the states feel. And this degree of the security dilemma's intensity, according to realist scholars, is dependent on two factors, complementary. The first factor is a geographic one. It relates to geographical, territorial, proximity, territorial contiguity. And the second factor relates to the nature of weapons possessed by the different states. So it is a military technological element. It relates, this is what theorists call the offense-defense balance. So we will tackle these two major points in today's chapter. First variable that we will, the first variable that we will have a look at is the geographical element, the geographical proximity, the territorial contiguity as a factor of favoring the risks of war by increasing the intensity of the security dilemma that states in general feel because of the absence of any overarching authority. So in the history of international, of political thought, political thought and political doctrines to some extent, there is one approach of politics, politics in general, international politics more specifically, which claims that politics and therefore international relations are determined by, geograph geogra by geographical factors, by geography. This approach is called geopolitics. Geopolitics in the meaning given to this term by those who created this kind of approach. The approach goes back to the end of the 19th century. It was a Swedish scholar, Challen, Challen, I don't know how to pronounce this, Rudolf Challen, who put forward the definition of geopolitics as, I quote, the study of the state as a geographical body. The study of the state, and therefore also of relations among states, as a geographical body. That is to say, the, 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 the geographical space, the borders, uh, the size of a territory, the fact for a state to be located on the, in the, at the core of a continent or uh, to be an island in the midst of an ocean, etc., influences basically, determines actually uh, the international political interactions of a state and to some extent even its domestic politics. So this geopolitical approach was put forward by the Swedish scholar Kjellin, by the Germans uh, Ratzel, uh, Friedrich Ratzel, by Haushofer, Karl Haushofer, by the American uh, Alfred Mahan, by um, another American uh, a bit later during World War II, Spikeman, Nicholas Spikeman, and by the British half of Mackinder. Geopolitics, however, also was used and, uh, um, well, it was uh, applied uh, and betrayed by the Nazis, who took from the German first geopolitical authors, Ratzel and also for the expression Lebensraum, that is to say the vital space that the Nazis needed uh, to, to, to prosper. And they, they put forward this, this idea when they decided to, to invade uh, Eastern Europe, of course. So this, 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 it is not in this term that geopolitics should be used. In this uh, meaning that geopolitics should be used, it is also not in, in the meaning of the common sense expression geopolitics, which is more or less synonymous with international affairs. First and foremost in France, geopolitique de quelque chose is a term which is pretty often used in the media. I, I, do, not, I do not appreciate this, uh, this confusion between the original approach, nowadays forgotten, and the common sense or the ideological the use of this term. Anyway. What is important for us is that in the discipline of international relations, the geopolitical approach is no longer part of the state of the art, of the art, though there is also a critical geopolitical approach recently anyway. Though geopolitical, um, the geopolitical approach is no longer mainstream, 
ever since political thinkers and political theorists nowadays do look for the causes of war, they implicitly or explicitly take into account some geographical dimension. They consider that geography, yes, does play a role in the occurrence of wars. And the first one is Thomas Hobbes himself. Thomas Hobbes, you know that he's the founding father of uh, philosophical realism. If we, if we forget the uh, Thucydides, who was a historian, if we, if we forget Machiavelli too, who, who wrote in a period where there was no, yet, no, no sovereign states yet, and therefore no international system yet, strictly speaking at least. He made no distinction between domestic politics politics and international politics. So Hobbes was the first to do so. And he was the first to do so because he claimed that international relations would take place in an anarchical environment, what he called the state of nature. This is what he wrote. And this state of nature was synonymous with the state of war. In all times, kings and persons of sovereign authority, in all times, kings and persons of sovereign authority, that is to say, in all times, political unity because of their independency, because of their independency, no authority, are in continual jealousies in the state and posture of gladiators having their weapons pointing, their eyes fixed on one another. So in this, defi in this definition, the state of nature is in general a never ending state of war. In all times, all the kings and all the persons of sovereign authority due to the mere fact that they are independent from each other, sovereign, due to this mere fact, all the states are in the attitude of gladiators having their weapons pointing upon one another. So the state of anarchy and therefore the state of war is a general characteristic. But twice, twice in his Leviathan, he specifies that the state of war first and foremost, regards relations between neighboring states. Not states in general, but two states that are neighbors. Listen first to the first quote, chapter 13. It is upon the frontiers of the kingdoms that states have forts, garrisons, and guns. It is upon their neighbors, frontiers neighbors, that they have continual spies, and an attitude of war upon their neighbors, upon the frontiers. And in another chapter of the Leviathan Commonwealths, that is to say political independent units, live in the condition of a perpetual war, this is the general claim, upon the confines of battle with their frontiers armed, the geographical elements, and cannons planted around about against their neighbors, against their neighbors around about. So these two quotes obviously emphasize that or suggest, these two quotes suggest, sorry, that the state of war concerns above all relationships among neighboring countries. And contemporary empirical, that is to say quantitative inquiries, researches do confirm that wars occur more often than not among neighboring states. If you look at the biography of today's chapter, the third reference, Paul Bremer, Dangerous Diets. He looked at the wars that broke out thanks to the statistics of the Corridor of War Project between 1815 and 1980. And this is the conclusion that he drew. Two neighboring countries, two neighboring countries, be their border a land border, France and Germany, or a maritime border, France and Great Britain. Two neighboring countries are, ladies and gentlemen, 30, 35 times, 35 times more likely to go to war against each other than two non contiguous states. So the probability of two neighboring states to go to war against each other is 30 times higher, 35 times higher than the probability of two non-contiguous states to go to war against each other. And Paul Deal 
references. Reference number five. Paul Deal claims that between 1815 and 1980, 92%, 92%, almost 100% of the world's opposing great powers were initiated first by a conflict, a, a conflict regarding a territorial dispute between a major power and one of its neighbors. Just take the example of Germany, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and this provoked World War II. As last but not least, John Vasquez. If you look at John Vasquez in the bibliography, you will find the reference to territorial contiguity, according to John Vasquez, is the discriminatory criterion between enduring state rivalries that escalate into wars and enduring interstate rivalries that do not escalate into wars. We'll come back to this because he considers that the Cold War, there was no risk for the Cold War to escalate into a hot war for the very simple reason that there is no territorial proximity between the US. There was no territorial contiguity between the US and the USSR, and there is nowadays no territorial contiguity between the US and Russia. And conversely, Germany and France, who went to war against each other three times within three generations, 1870, 1914, 1939, are contiguous neighbors. So statistical inquiries do corroborate that the majority of wars oppose neighboring states against each other. In the contemporary world, there is a risk of war between North Korea and South Korea. There is no risk of war between North Korea and Argentina or Australia or Finland. In Africa, the last war that broke out opposed Ethiopia to Eritrea, neighboring states. If we go back to the past, during the Cold War, China was opposed to India. They are neighbors. Recently, the territorial, the, the, the border dispute uh, re-emerged two or three months ago last summer. India and Pakistan are neighbors. Israel and its Arab neighbors are neighbors. Uh, in the past, uh, France and Germany, uh, France and Spain, France and Great Britain, or England actually, Russia and Poland. So. There are so many examples that, of course, we all agree in saying that there is a risk of war, there's a higher risk of war, very significantly higher among neighboring states than among non-neighboring states. But why is this the case? There are two reasons. The first reason is put forward by Raymond in his Peace and War. According to Raymond territory is one of the three concrete objectives that states are looking for when they resort to armed violence. Listen to Raymond A political unit occupies a certain territory and it can consider this territory to be too small. So in, I go on quoting, the rivalry among peoples, the possession of space was the original stake. Beyond this first objective, sovereigns often have estimated their greatness according to the number of their subjects. They want to increase their populations. What they desire beyond frontiers is not space as such, but men living on the space. And last but not least, according to Raymond Aron, Sometimes states are less anxious to conquer than to convert. That is to say, they do not calculate the size of their territory, not even the number of the people living within their borders. They are interested in spreading their faith, their ideology, what they consider to be the true, the only true faith. They want the organization 
corresponding to their interpretation of life. They want this organization to gradually encompass all the humanity. So if we take into account these three concrete objectives, space, uh, men living on the space, and the ideology of said men, then, of course, the space that the state is spontaneously tempted to conquer. The populations that the state is spontaneously tempted to integrate into its borders and the people that the states spontaneously want to convert are the neighboring units, the neighboring populations. Those of the immediate neighborhood, of course, because it's easier to conquer these territories than far away distant territories. So this is the first reason, a very concrete objective. And Holsey, I put his analysis in the bibliography, not of today's class actually, but in the introductory chapter because it's the general analysis of war ever since the contemporary international system, war, the state and the state of war. According to Kalevi Holsey, he's a, a Finnish scholar, more than 50% of all the armed conflicts that broke out from 1648 West Bania, to 1989, the end of the Cold War, more than 50% had territorial disputes as their immediate cause, as their immediate stake. So people want to increase their territory. But there is a second reason why geographical contiguity, territorial proximity is likely to favor the outbreak of wars, even when there is no board of disputes, even if there is no eagerness by any of the two states to conquer a part of the other state's territory. This second reason is linked to the security dilemma. The security dilemma indeed is directly correlated to neighborhood. All else being equal, all else being equal, the insecurity that a state feels on behalf of other states proceeds above all from neighboring states. Why? Because the intensity depends on, intensity of the security dilemma depends on the intensity of the interactions that states do have with one another. This intensity of international of interactions that states have with one another depends itself on the geographical proximity. The idea traces back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You know that, you may know that according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his, uh, the picture that he proposed of the state of nature among men, among men, primitive men, the noble savages. You know that, you may know that according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, men in the state of nature were living peacefully because they were living in isolation. There were no, almost no, at least no regular interaction. And this is the reason why he came to the, to the, the, the point that, that I mentioned when defining war in our introductory chapter. War is a relation of a state to another state, not of a man to another man. States, that is to say, collective units, go to war against each other. And what distinguishes states from units, from men in the state of nature, is that states do have regular interactions among each other. They no longer live in isolation. They are, to some extent, interdependent from each other. And the more they have interactions, the higher is the risk of war. If then we establish the link with our point called the security dilemma, all other things being equal, it is with neighboring states that states first and foremost have regular interaction. If you have no interactions with another state, there is absolutely no risk of any conflict breaking out. And therefore, there is a risk of a war between North Korea or South Korea and Argentina or Finland or South Africa 
or New Zealand. It is first and foremost with your neighbors that you have regular interactions. And according to Rousseau, the more regular interactions, this is true for men, and it's also true for states, the higher the risk of conflicts, which therefore might escalate into wars. This idea, according to which the security dilemma, the security dilemma's intensity increases when a state deals with a neighboring state, this idea has been theorized, rationalized by contemporary authors. And the most important author is Barry Buzan. Barry Buzan in his book, People, State, People, States and Fear, that was published, the first edition was published in 1983, that is to say during the Cold War. And in this book, he coined a new concept, which is called security complex. The security complex focuses on the impact of geography on anarchy. Listen to Buzan, People Stand in Fear, page 190, 191. A security complex is defined as a group of states whose primary security concerns are linked together sufficiently closely that their national securities cannot be considered apart from one another. And here then is the most important idea. Threats operate more potently over short distances. Threats operate more potently over short distances. And therefore security interactions with neighbors will have to tend, will tend to have priority security interactions with neighbors will have, will tend to have priority because threats by definition operate more powerfully over short distances. Security complexes are generated by the interaction of anarchy and geography. The political structure of anarchy confronts all the states with the security dilemma. This is Hobbes. All the states feel insecure in general. But the web set of security interdependence is powerfully mediated by the effects of geography. To put it differently, even when there is no territorial dispute among two neighbors, even when they agree upon the border, that separates their two territories, the mere fact to be neighbors increases the risks of war. Because you first and foremost feel threatened by your neighbor. All else being equal, at least this is the case for average states. Things are different, and Buzan, of course, acknowledges that are different for those powers who are powerful enough to send their troops to use their weapons everywhere in the world. But this is true nowadays for a very small number of powers, the major powers, and first and foremost, the US, indeed able to deploy its troops everywhere and to wage wars everywhere. But the vast majority of states, this is not the case. They first and foremost focus on their neighbor. They perceive their neighbor to be a prospective, a potential threat for their own security. And sometimes states are even uh, tempted to increase their territory, not because they want, as Aaron said, to occupy a larger space or to uh, um, have more uh, pop a higher population or to convert a sad population to their own faith. Sometimes states are eager to enlarge their territory in order to push their neighbors, their threatening neighbors, farther away, in order to increase their territory and thus to lower the security dilemma that they feel on behalf of their neighbors. This was the case for Israel. Israel, for instance, launched various wars, you know that against its neighbors, notably Jordan, Egypt, and Syria. The aim of Israel was not to increase its territory. Well, things are different for the West Bank. Okay, but the West Bank is not Egypt. It's not, it's not Jordan either. 
Palestine, and it's not, it's not, not Syria. So it's not a neighboring Arab state. It's Palestinian territory, but not a neighboring Arab state. Regarding Israel's relations with neighboring states, Israel launched wars against Egypt and against Syria, not to increase the territory, not to increase its population, nor to spread the Jewish faith, but to better defend itself. To better defend itself thanks to the conquest of territories belonging to its immediate neighbors who, who were too close to the core territory of Israel, which you know that is very small. And therefore, when they signed a peace treaty with Egypt, they acknowledged to give the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt. But Israel still goes on occupying the Golan Heights that it conquered also during the Six Days War in 1967. The Golan Heights, a Syrian territory northeast of Israel, southwest of Syria. Why does Israel go on occupying this territory? Because there is no peace treaty with Syria and because Israel still feels what theorists call the security dilemma in its relationship with Syria because of the never ending state of war, which characterized the Syrian Israeli relationship. There is no peace agreement between the two states. Israel, Israel's wars or Israel's uh, decisions to, to, to resort to violence are pretty interesting for our topic because Israel also went to war against a second state or more than actually a second state, other, other states not immediate neighbors, in other words. In 1981, Israel, Israeli aircraft attacked and destroyed a nuclear civil, civil nuclear plant in Iraq, Oz Iraq. Uh, a nuclear, a civil nuclear plant that Saddam Hussein, who was already the dictator in 1981, had built with the help of the French nuclear technology, civil technology. According to Israel, there was a risk, of course, of um, uh, Saddam Hussein being tempted to transform this civil nuclear technology into a military uh, nuclear technology. This is not the point we are interested in this chapter. In this chapter, we are interested in the fact that Israel attacked Iraq, which is not an immediate neighbor. In other words, the security dilemma felt by Israel in this case and by states in general is not merely influenced by the geographical contiguity, by the territorial proximity, but it can also be influenced, shaped, determined, co-determined by what realist theorists call the offense-defense balance, that is to say the nature of weapons that the different states possess. So after looking at the geographical impact upon the security dilemma, let's look at the nature of weapons as an element of the security dilemma. According to realists, since each state feels insecure, we saw this some minutes ago, each state strengthens, increases its own military capacity. In behaving this way, states do put into practice the wisdom, which goes back to the Roman Empire, a Roman general, Vegetius was his name, this is what he said, and you know the expression, civis pacem parabellum, if you want peace, prepare for war. The idea is that if you prove your potential adversary, neighbor or not, that you are strong, at least as strong as a said neighbor, this neighbor, this state, neighbor or not, sorry, will stop short from attacking you because he cannot expect to win. This is the balance of power theory in general. But those theorists, such as Mointar, 
who claim that states should act this way, forget that, forget the argument put forward by security dilemma theorists to claim that if you increase your own military resources, you incite other states to do so as well, thus never putting an end to your security dilemma, actually aggravating it because of the vicious circle, the vicious spiral. There is, in other words, a kind of contradiction or kind of disagreement among realists. Those who, did to, to adhere to the deterrence theory claim that states should increase their military resources in order to prepare them to wage a war. And those who adhere to the security dilemma thesis claim that the mere the fact, the mere fact to improve your military preparedness actually aggravates your situation because it compels other states to do so too. The question then we may ask is who's right and who's wrong? Both cannot be right at the same time. Is Morgenthau right when he says that military preparedness is a force for peace or peace for stability? Or is John Hertz and John and uh, uh, Jervis are they right when they claim, Robert Jervis, when they claim that by increasing your military preparedness, you actually initiate an arms race because the other state will feel compelled to increase its own resources too. Who's right, who's wrong? As usual, empirical inquiries, empirical research is undertaken to try to uh, find a way out of this kind of competition. And the first author, the most important author, so looked at the concrete impact of arms races. Do they permit stability to prevail or do they end up favoring or triggering the outbreak of war? Michael Wallace is his name. Michael Wallace was the first to undertake, look at the biography, was the first to undertake such an empirical research. He defines, first of all, arms races, I quote, as simultaneous abnormal rates of growth in the military budget, simultaneous abnormal rates of growth in the military budget of two or more than two rival states resulting from the competitive pressure of the rivalry itself, not to other factors such as domestic pressure groups, etc. An arms race is characterized by a quick abnormal growth rates of military spendings due to the rivalry between two states or more than two states. So he looked at whether such arms races in the past had favored or not the outbreak of wars and as usual he goes back to he uses the courage of war project uh, data the wars between 1815 and 1865 and he finds out that the security dilemma thesis is right and that the deterrence theory is wrong. More specifically, he found out that 23 out of 28 rivalries, 23 out of 28, that is to say 82%, 82% of rivalries that were characterized by arms races led to the hard war. And only three out of 71 conflicts that were not characterized by arms races, only three out of these 71 did end up in a war, did result in a war, which means in this case a corroboration rate of 96%. If there is no arms race, there is 96% chance of no war breaking out. If there is an arms race, there is a 82% probability of the rivalry to end up in a war. Wallace's researches, research, the research by inquiries by Wallace were criticized, of course, as usual, in the discipline never ending debate starts. 
And I go not into the detail. What I want you to remind is the general conclusion of the kind of agreement consensus that uh, was uh, found at the end of all these researches. The consensus is the following one. The more states are involved in an arms race, more than two, and the longer an arms race is lasting in time, decades rather than years, the higher the risks of such a rivalry and therefore such an arms race to end up provoking the outbreak of war, which to some extent seems common sense. If there are many states at the same time increasing their weapons, their, their resources in weapon, terms of weapons, participating in arms race, in other words, and if such an answer is lasts pretty long, then it seems self-evident that a war will end up breaking out. This fairly commonplace consensus conclusion, however, does not permit us to explain or to understand the peaceful end of the Cold War. You know that the Cold War was the most significant and the most dangerous arms race ever. It lasted four decades and a half, from 45, 46, 47 to 89. It opposed the US and the USSR, or the US and its allies to the USSR and its allies. So not the whole world, but the most significant powers in the world were concerned by this arms race. And yet, it came to a peaceful end which refutes the consensus of the empirical research is according to which the longer a race lasts and the more states do participate in it, the higher the risk of a war. How can we then explain this counterintuitive fact that the Cold War did not escalate into a hot war? Vasquez, and I come back to him, we saw this point uh, half an hour or so ago. Vasquez gives us the first explanation, the geographical explanation. If the US Soviet arms race did not provoke a hot war, an effective war opposing the Soviets to the Americans, it is because this enduring rivalry was not concerning territorially contiguous states. There is no common border between the Soviet Union and the USSR. They are geographically separated. So no immediate uh, stake, no immediate issue at stake, no territorial dispute, and no direct security dilemma due to the absence of distance separating these two powers. But of course, there is a second explanation which I would like to deepen because it is the one that is pretty that is uh, more often put forward to try to account for the somehow peaceful end of the Cold War and therefore the stability, the overall stability of the Cold War, despite the rivalry and despite uh, the arms race, which you know that you may know that ended up in both superpowers possessing between 35,000 and 40,000 nuclear warheads, 35 for the US, 40,000 for the South. So, this second explanation aiming at accounting for uh, the peaceful end of this pretty dangerous arms race. This second explanation emphasizes the nature of the weapons that were involved during this arms race, and more specifically, the nuclear weapons, because you know that the balance of power between the two major powers, the two superpowers, was called the balance of terror, the balance of nuclear terror. Now, nuclear weapons are defensive weapons. They are conceived to deter, not to attack. And therefore, in this explanation, and if you accept this explanation, it is because of their defensive nature as opposed to the offensive nature of weapons. It is because of their defensive nature that the arms race opposing the Soviets to the Americans did not escalate into a hot war. And here then we come 
more precisely to the so-called offense-defense balance. The offense-defense balance thesis put forward notably by one American scholar, Stephen von Evera, in his book, Causes of War, Power and the Roots of Conflict of Armed Conflict. So what this, this balance of power, this offense balance theory, it's different from the balance of power, though there are some links, we come back to them at the end. Um, what is this offense defense balance thesis all about? Well, it relates, it refers to the nature of armaments and more specifically to the fact that ever since human beings uh, produced weapons, there is a kind of dialectics between the sword and the shield. The sword symbolizes offensive weapons, for instance, missiles nowadays, or aircraft bombing. And the shield symbolizes defensive weapons. For instance, today, surface -to air missiles who down aircraft who, who are eager to bomb, precisely. So ever since weapons were invented, and well, I'm afraid ever since humanity uh, has been existing on the planet Earth, weapons do exist, and there is a kind of race, a kind of competition, opposing offensive arms to defensive arms. Men try to build swords likely able to go through the shields, but they also look for shields able to contain the sword. And according to this thesis, depending on the technological development, depending also on military doctrine, how to use the weapons that were built, that were invented, depending on technological evolutions and on military doctrines, it is sometimes easier for the sword to go through the shield and it is sometimes possible for the shield to contain the sword. Sometimes the opposite is true, the shield is unable or too costly to acquire to, to stop the sword and in this case the sword is able to go through the sheep. In other words, sometimes it is easier to defend one's territory thanks to efficient defensive weapons. And it is more costly to attack because you have to invent new weapons likely to go through the existing defensive technology. And sometimes it is easier to conquer territory by an aggressive war because the existing technology permits offensive weapons to destroy defensive ones, or it is less costly to build and to acquire efficient offensive weapons than to build and to possess efficient defensive weapons. So the offense-defense balance then has been defined by Stefan von Evra as, I quote, the relative ease of offense and defense against aggression. The relative ease, easiness of offense and defense against aggression. It has also been defined by Charles Glazer in his rational theory of international politics as the ratio, listen, listen ladies and gentlemen, the ratio of the cost of the forces the attacker requires to take territory, the ratio of the cost of forces the attacker needs to attack a territory, the ratio to the cost of the forces the defender has deployed to defend the territory. If this ratio is superior to one, this means that the attacker must invest more money to overcome the defense, then the defender must invest money to contain the attacker. In this case, 
the balance is called defense dominant. There is an advantage for the defense. If the ratio is inferior to one, this means that the defender must spend more money to build an efficient defense and the attacker needs to spend less money to build an efficient offensive army. And in this case, it is easier and less costly to attack than to defend. In this case, ladies and gentlemen, the balance, the offense, defense balance is called offense dominance. The advantage goes to those who attack because they spend less money to be efficient when attacking than the other one has to defend in order to, to spend in order to defend efficiently. It's terrible. This offense balance, offense defense balance, of course, directly impacts the security dilemma, and actually, should I say, the intensity of the security dilemma, the degree of emergency of the security dilemma felt by the different states. If the balance is offense dominant, the intensity of the security dilemma increases because every state is afraid of every state which is eager and which believes that it will be easy to conquer because the efficiency is favorable to offensive weapons. I repeat, if the balance is offense dominant, which means that it is easier or less costly to attack than to defend, then the intensity of the security dilemma increases. A state that acquires more weapons than the other one has an offensive advantage. The state likely to be the target of the attack, if it replies, will acquire offensive weapons. By definition, these are more efficient in an offense dominant balance. In this case, the first state will be compelled to go on. Security dilemma in this case indeed is very vicious. The opposite is true when the balance is defense dominant. When the balance is defense dominant, that is to say when it is easier or less costly to defend than to attack, then the intensity of the security dilemma decreases. If a state acquires more and more defensive weapons, by definition, in a defense dominant balance, defensive weapons are more efficient. If an, an, um, a state acquires more and more defensive weapons, well, the other state, if it does not react, there is no risk, because by definition, with its defensive weapons, the first state cannot attack. And if the second state reacts by acquiring itself defensive weapons, there is a kind of virtuous circle. The more they have weapons, the more they are likely to defend themselves. And if they are likely to defend themselves, the less likely the other one will attack, because there is absolutely no probability that it will win, given the existing technology, at least during one specific span of time. By definition, this can never last pretty long, because men are looking for new weapons, likely to change the balance. If the balance is offense dominant, those who are afraid by this reality look for new efficient defensive weapons. If they manage to do so, if they succeed in building efficient defenses, those who are eager to attack will look for efficient offensive weapons. There is a never-ending competition between the sword and the shield or between the shield and the sword. Of course, when the intensity of the security dilemma increases, the risks of war are higher. And if the intensity of the security dilemma decreases because of a defense dominant balance, then the risks of war are lower. Stephen von Evera, after putting forward this fairly abstract uh, theoretical model, looked at the concrete historical record first of how the competition uh, developed throughout the history of mankind, the competition between the sword 
than the shield. And then he looks at, in different historical period, I will focus on one, how this competition impacted, affected the outbreak of war or, or not, or the stability, that is to say the, the triumph of uh, peaceful periods. So in the history of mankind, very, very quickly, some number of calls. In antiquity, ladies and gentlemen, the then existing technologies favored mass infantry warfare. Cheap iron permitted to build efficient swords. A shield made of iron is too heavy. So the shield was not made of iron and therefore the sword could indeed pierce through. Therefore, in antiquity, the offensive attacker was favored. And according to Stefan von Evra, bigger political units had an advantage because of the mere fact that they had more they are larger standing armies. The Romans first, the barbarian invaders later, had a larger population likely to use swords who were more efficient than shields, and this permitted them to overrun their enemies. And the Roman Empire became larger and larger before collapsing, of course. So in ancient times, the then existing technology favored offensive. Weapon. During the Middle Ages, a shift occurred thanks to the fortification techniques and thanks to the use of cavalry rather than infantry. You know that fortresses during the Middle Ages were almost invulnerable. An aristocrat, a knight, a prince, a duke in his fortress could dominate the surrounding territory and nobody was able to defeat him because of the un invulnerability of the fortresses. The then fortification techniques favored the defense until the invention of powder, until the invention of cannons that made fortresses castles vulnerable. The advantage does went back to the offense. And the feudal lord, Abel, thanks to, its, to his money, to have more cannons than his rivals, ended up becoming the ruler of a more and more important territory. And thus emerged the modern nation state, favorable to one of the feudal lords, the king, who gradually eliminated all the local regional feudal rivals who were not rich enough to buy those cannons able to destroy the fortresses. Advantage to the offense. And a lot of wars broke out, permitting the unification of France, of Spain, of England, etc. In the 17th century, the French know him, Vauban, the French engineer Vauban, on the Louis XIV, invented new fortification techniques, which gave the advantage back to the defensive. Revolutionary France invented not a new weapon, but a new military doctrine, or a new army, the mass conscription army, all the French citizens, male citizens, sorry, were forced to serve in the French army. And this advantage in the number of soldiers likely to be sent to wage wars permitted Napoleon, at least during some years, to overrun his European enemies. The greater size and the greater mobility of the new armies permitted Napoleon to win the first years of the wars he fought against the rest of Europe. During the 19th century, however, 
the various conservative European states abandoned the mass conscription army because they were afraid of the potential revolutionary consequences. So the advantage of the defense did not last, all the more so new weapons were invented. New weapons were invented, notably mass killing weapons such as the machine gun. The machine gun gave the advantage back to the defense because you needed to entrench the machine guns and you impeded any enemy to attack you. This is what happened during World War I. The French ended up winning World War I thanks to the advantage of the defensive military gun, which did not permit the Germans to reach Paris. The Germans, however, the Nazi the Nazis invented and reshifted the balance, invented the new offensive weapon, the Panzer, that is to say the tank, thanks to its destructive capacity and thanks also to the Blitzkrieg doctrine within which they used the tanks in the German armies, gave the advantage back to the offense. And since 1945, we come back to the Cold War, since 1945, the invention of nuclear weapons gave an overwhelming advantage to the defense. And ever since 1945, in the relation among major powers, things are different, we come back to this, in the relations between major powers and smaller ones, or non-state actors all the more so, in the, relation of, in the relations of among major powers, Nowadays, the advantage goes to the defense because of the nuclear weapon, which is a weapon supposed not to be used, but to deter. That is to say, the non-first use doctrine uses, uses, uh, considers the nuclear weapon as a weapon of deterrence that should convince an adversary not to attack you. So if everybody is convinced not to attack, by definition, the defense is advantage. So once we had a look at the evolution of the offense-defense balance throughout the, the, the centuries and throughout actually two millennia, he looks more specifically if an offensive, an offense dominant balance caused more wars and if a defense dominant balance favored stability during various periods in history, and one of the periods that he's analyzing is Europe, the period from 1789, French Revolution, up to the end of the Cold War. So very precisely 200 years, 1789, 1989. He looks at the impact of the offense-defense balance upon the risks of war, the chances of peace. So what does he see? What, to which conclusion can he come? thanks to his, this empirical research during the period that goes from 1789 to 1815. Advantage to the offense, thanks to the French invention of the mass conscription army as opposed to the armies of the aristocrats. We see this in our second semester class. The creation to, the decision to create, sorry, the decision to create popular conscription armies favored the offense. And indeed, we have a cycle of 20 years of wars from 1972, 1993 to 1815. 25 or actually 23 years of never ending war. From 1815 to 1914, the advantage goes back to the defense because of the political risks of popular armies, of conscription armies. The European governments abandoned these armies and Therefore, the defense is restored again. And according to uh, Stefan von Ebra, this is a period of stability. The long 19th century is a stable period among European powers. According to Stefan von Ebra, the balance is still defense dominant in 1890, from 1890 to 1918, it includes World War I. But in this case, in this period, sorry, there were many wars and present for most World War I. From 1919 to 1945, we saw this two minutes ago, the, the advantage goes back to offense because of the German Blitzkrieg doctrine and because of the German Panzers, the German tanks, armored tanks. And this period indeed is a period of 
intense armed conflicts, World War II. And last but not least, since 1945, the advantage goes to the defensive deterrent, deterring weapon called nuclear weapon. And there is no major war that broke out in Europe during uh, this period since 1945. No major weapon among major European powers. So according to Stefan von Ebras, his hypothesis, if the balance is offense dominant, there are more wars. If the balance is defense dominant, there are there is more stability, there are less wars. According to Stefan von Ebra, his hypothesis is corroborated empirically, with one single exception, the period of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. The then balance was defense dominant because of the invention of machine gun and entrenchment warfare. But it is a war, it is a period which saw the outbreak of World War I, a very intense conflict. So how then does uh, Van Evera explain this kind of ref refutation of his hypothesis? Well, he analyzes this refutation as actually due to the perception by the then European elites who believed, wrongly so, but they believed, and everybody shared this belief, that the balance was offense dominant. They believed that the states who would launch an offense would have an advantage. So they, missed, they committed the mistake. They mistook the meaning of the machine gun, which they considered to be given advantage to the attacker while it actually gave an advantage to the defender. This is what he calls in an article, which he later included in his book, the cult of the offensive. And the best example, according to him, of this cult of the offensive was the German von Schlieffen plan, who believed that German could easily overrun the French by attacking via the Belgian uh, hills, the Ardennes. But then the Germans were stopped around Verdun and they ended up losing the war advantage. The real advantage, the actual advantage went to the defense, but the perception was wrong. Wrong perception gave the advantage to the offense and therefore those states decided to go to war in 1914 because of this mistake, because of this error. So Van Evra then comes to the general conclusion and this is the one I want you to remember regarding his theory, once again, all the different theories, ladies and gentlemen, I do not claim they are right. I do not claim they are wrong. They are corroborated by some empirical uh, events. They are refuted by other empirical uh, processes. This is always the case for social science theories or explanations. What I want you to know is what these theories are all about, and I want you to do, maybe, is to apply them, to contribute, to improve them, either by refuting them or by corroborating them. If you refute them, the progress in science consists in the conclusion, this theory is not valid, we have to look for another one. So there is a kind of progress. If you improve it and you permit the theory that is yours to be corroborated, then obviously science is uh, growing. So this is the use of all these theories. If you accept this framework, then you can explain this or that event. If you prefer another one, you can give another explanation. All the explanations are potentially valid. Science progresses thanks to the, thanks to the comparison to the controversy, to the debate among uh, potentially equally valid theories empirically valid some of course of them are more often corroborated than other ones logically so on Evra's conclusion then is the following one war is more likely when conquest is perceived to be easy thanks to a balance an offense defense balance perceived to be offense dominant and stability is favored 
when the balance is or is, is really or is perceived to be defense dominant. And his last conclusion logically is shifts in the offense defense balance or shifts in the perception of the offense defense balance affects the risks of war and the chances of peace. If there is a shift from a defense dominant to an offense dominant balance, there are higher risks of war. If there is a shift from an offense dominant balance to a defense dominant balance, actual or perceived, then peace is favored. There, is, there are lesser risks of war. Of course, as usual, and this is what I somehow anticipated one minute ago, not everybody agrees with his theory. And his model was criticized. It was criticized, first of all, regarding the possibility to really distinguish whether a weapon is offensive or defensive. A sword, a shield is defensive. You can hardly kill someone with a, sh with a shield. But a sword, while being spontaneously offensive, you can kill him with this, but you can also prevent someone. You can defend yourself thanks to a, sh to a sword by preventing someone from coming too close to you, preventing someone to attack you in, in, in a face-to-face -face, uh, struggle, combat. So it is not always easy, and the same is true for modern weapons, of course. Missiles can be offensive, but to some extent, they can also permit you to defend your territory if you are attacked. So it is not always easy to claim that a weapon is exclusively defensive or exclusively offensive. It can be used both in offensive operations and in defensive operations. And let's look at nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, of course, we'll come back to this in another chapter, uh, in chapter seven. No, in chapter six. Um, Nuclear weapons are considered to be defensive weapons. Not even defensive weapons, because they do not defend, they deter someone from attacking you. So they are not even used to permit somebody to defend him or herself. They are used to prevent someone from attacking. That's the difference between deterrence and defense. Nuclear weapons give the advantage to the defense. But this is true only as long as all the possessors of nuclear weapons agree on a non-first use doctrine. If, and this is to what we will come back in our chapter six, potential future nuclear actors, nuclear powers, drop the non-first use doctrine, adopt a first use doctrine, that is say consider that they may wage wars with a nuclear weapon, maybe because they do not fear to commit suicide, in this case, the nuclear weapon as such is no longer necessarily defensive. It can become an offensive weapon. So, yes, it is not always easy to distinguish the offensive from the defensive and vice versa nature of a weapon. Moreover, To look at weapons is not sufficient if we take into account the fact that weapons nowadays are integrated in systems of weapons. What does that mean? This means that some powers nowadays, some major powers, and for example, most Americans, are able to possess and actually possess weapons which are both defense dominant and offense dominant, at least according to the doctrine of their use. That is to say, the US benefits both from a defensive advantage, thanks to its possession of nuclear weapons, deterrence, but it also possesses the advantage, it also has the advantage of possessing offense dominant weapons such as missiles, such as precision guided missiles, such as smart weapons, such as drones, which give them an offensive weapon, an offensive advantage since they cannot be the target of counterattacks by those who 
these missiles, these drones target? Why is the US able, mainly the US, nowadays, since the end of the Cold War, to wage zero death wars? Because it launches wars, privileging weapons that kill from the distance. And those who use these weapons, those who fire, are invulnerable, invulnerable. They cannot be killed by those whom they kill. So war, in this case, is no longer a duel in the very strict physical meaning of two warriors trying to kill themselves in a face-to-face -face combat. The US, in other words, thanks to its weapons systems, benefits both of a defensive advantage when dealing with other nuclear weapons, and it profits from an offensive weapon uh, advantage when it is dealing with so-called rogue states or rogue terrorist networks. In other words, to merely, and this will be the conclusion of today's class, to merely look at technological elements is to forget that beyond weapons, the political economic context of the relationship between two or more than two units, political units, political actors, political states in our case, but collective units, more than the, it is the general context. It is the general balance, the general ratio of all the material resources that are possessed by states. The Americans, of course, have efficient offensive and efficient defensive weapons because they have a rich economy and because they are technologically developed more than until now all its potential adversaries. We therefore have to broaden our focus. Not merely do we have to look at the offense, defense balance or the security dilemma more generally, we have to look at the more general balance of power or the more general power resources that are possessed or not by states. This is what we will be doing in our chapter five next week, where we will have a look at the impact of power distribution, the power structure, the power configuration among major units as a cause for. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to today's class. Hope to see you again, if I may. Next week in our chapter five, have a good one.